Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Kitty, and to the Aspen Institute for the partnership with NBC News. I worked in China as a China bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal from 2005 to 2009, a very different era. Um, it was the fifth largest economy when I arrived, the second largest when I left. And I'm just so pleased to be here with uh, four of the foremost experts on China to discuss this pivotal moment. I have to say, looking at this just uh, powerful distillation of the, of the history of U.S.-China relations, I'd like to start off by asking the panelists, is the level of conflict that we're seeing now, was it inevitable, and how dangerous do you think it is? Stephen, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Rebecca. I, you have um, quite a, uh, a gift in taking an economy from number five to number two in a <laughs> short period of time. Um, I, I do think that there was a certain inevitability of this uh, conflict. I'm, I focus on the U.S. and China from a relationship perspective, and I've written books about the codependency of the U.S. and China to nations, to systems that uh, initially started off relying very heavily on each other. But as is the case in human pathology, when um, uh, partners start to change, uh, the other partner is uncomfortable with that. Uh, and if those uh, levels of discomfort are not resolved, then they start to uh, lash out, frictions arise, and ultimately conflict emerges. So your video did a great job of, of capturing this transition from uh, a um, stable codependency to a seriously conflicted codependency. Jessica. I would say that it's no, by no means inevitable that we will have reached where we are today. And in fact, I think the very idea of inevitability suggests that we will be, have harder time finding ways to manage the tensions uh, responsibly. So, I mean, I think, for example, you know, we saw, of course, with the rising power and a, a power that's established, there are inevitably going to be tensions and differences in interests, differences in values. But I would say that, you know, perhaps, you know, just rewind a few years to the Trump administration, there had been a you know, phase one trade deal arranged. And I fully expected that President Trump would have run uh, for re-election on the campaign that he had, you know, wrested concessions from China. But then you had the COVID pandemic hit. And I think that the COVID pandemic really exacerbated the sense of domestic insecurity um, by leaders on both sides of this relationship. You had fingers being pointed at the other. And so rather than getting our own domestic house in order here in the United States, and of course China has its own sh massive share of problems. Instead, we've begun to project our insecurities and blame them uh, on the other side. And today you have a situation in which, um, you know, leaders on both sides are elected officials, some of them calling China an existential threat. And of course, you have many in Beijing who feel the same way. Um, for me, it's really important that we resist the idea that conflict uh, is inevitable, because if you think it's inevitable, all that's left to do is prepare to, to win and fight that war. But I'm so far at least gratified that both leaders in Beijing and Washington have been very clear that they seek to stabilize the relationship to prevent it from deteriorating any further. And that to me is the first signs of the beginning of the recognition that this downward spiral is in nobody's interest and we can, as we have in the past, manage it responsibly to find a better way. Bridge. Well, great. Thanks, Rebecca. And it's uh, really a pleasure to be here on this, on this great panel. Um, I would say that it was, if not inevitable, these tensions were highly likely to emerge. And the primary you know, sort of heuristic, if you will, that I use to look at, at the problem is basically a rising great and now a rising superpower. And of course, an established superpower. And if you go back to Thucydides, uh, not to be, uh, go, you know, test everybody's uh, knowledge of ancient history, you can see Graham Allison's important book on this topic. But, you know, what was the root cause of the problem? It was the rise of Athens and the fear that it caused in Sparta. So it's essentially structural, and I think one of the reasons that we've gotten here in this way is that we, I think, deluded ourselves uh, in perhaps uh, permissibly, uh, say, in the 1990s and 2000s, but less so as time went on, that this could be skirted, that this could be avoided. And so I actually I, I very much agree with Jessica that we're in a, a very dangerous situation. I think the situation could get much, much more dangerous, um, and I think it's important to take mitigating steps uh, to avoid intensifying the conflict where it's not necessary, but my view of what we need to basically do to deal with that is recognize that this is essentially a bipolar structural rivalry, accept that, prepare from a position of strength, and then look to see how we can stabilize it. I have a bit of a different, a different perspective, but I don't think com conflict is inevitable, but I think it's very possible. Jorge. 
I've, I'm not sure it was inevitable. I think it was a relationship based on false premises. I, I think uh, the United States was interested in accessing the Chinese market. That was very profitable for the United States, but uh, apparently under the guise of uh, democratizing China, uh, something the Chinese never agreed to. And they, of course, it was a very successful relationship economically until the Chinese uh, reached a point where they started flexing their muscle and all of a sudden it was no longer about democratizing, but about competition. And that's where the conflict rises. But it's not inevitable. It was just false pretenses for the relationship. There's very few areas of bipartisan agreement in Washington, as we all know these days, but China really has emerged as, as one of them. And uh, the Biden administration really didn't change much from uh, the Trump administration uh, uh, when, when Joe Biden took, took office. Are you seeing a continuation of that? Um, or is Blinken's visit, are the Democrats now trying to thaw? And, and Bridge, I'd love you to talk a bit about your, your efforts within the Republican Party to... Uh, to, to really um, say that it's China, not Russia, that it, that should be the priority. Sure. I mean, I think the way I look at it is I think China has become a point of consensus that it is a fundamental challenge and in many ways a, a threat. But I think this, the consensus is relatively superficial because what to do about that threat, how much change it requires in our policy, uh, you know, the nature of the challenge, that is very much not a matter of consensus. And I would actually say that that cuts across party lines. In many respects, I, I actually regard it as somewhat generational. Uh, you have older members on both sides who are basically, the, the instinct seems to be that, you know, you can, yes, China's a challenge, but you can slot it into the sort of pre-existing model. And often younger, you know, sort of under the age of 60 or something like that, people are more prepared to, um, to, 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 to sort of consider uh, major adaptation. I mean, just because you asked, Rebecca, I mean, my view is that China is a, is a true near peer or peer superpower. The economy is likely to continue growing. By some metrics, you know, how you measure economic size is itself a matter of debate. I mean, the Chinese have a much larger industrial base than we do. They have a much larger shipbuilding industry than we do. They are competing with us at the forefront of technology. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute, a very respected um, think tank in Australia, uh, judged recently that China was ahead of us in most areas of high technology. So my view is that I think, my fear is that we are talking a lot about China, but basically the mental model and the strategic model is more or less the same. And, and my view on the Ukraine war, I support the Ukrainians. I think what the Russians are doing is evil. I think the Ukrainian cause is just. But I think that my fear is that on both sides, there's this element, including in the Republican Party, that we can just kind of do this, and as John Kirby regularly says, walk and chew gum. And I'm thinking to myself, well, walk and chew gum. This is, that's not, I mean, you're walking or are you chewing gum with China? How about like sprinting a marathon? That would give you, give me a sense of what we're dealing with, with China. And I, my view is if we take on China in that way, we can prepare, we can provide the right set of incentives for, you know, right, or the proper set of incentives for China, also be restrained in the appropriate ways in what we demand of China, not over existentialize it. That's the best route for ultimately getting to detente, which I think is our goal. But if we try to get to detente now, I think we're likely, more likely to get taken advantage of. Just one point that I want to pick up on, actually, that Jorge said that I thought was very important. He um, made the point that... Um, a lot of this conflict, um, at least from the U.S. side, reflects uh, false pretenses. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I think there are false pretenses on both sides of this conflict. Let me just give you one example. Uh, trade. Trade was the big issue that you know, sparked <coughs> the, the tariffs and, and the sanctions uh, now uh, five years ago. But what if I told you the U.S. ran trade deficits last year with 106 different countries? We have a trade, a multilateral trade deficit, not a bilateral trade deficit with China. It's the biggest piece of our multilateral trade deficit. But the economist in me will tell you that we run trade deficits because we have a savings deficit. That's our problem. We want to blame that on China. China blames a lot of stuff on us using the same uh, fallacious reasoning. But this bipolar blame game has now escalated into you know, the high octane fuel of conflict escalation that can be ignited by sparks. And Ridge just talked about sparks. There are plenty of them around. So this is more than a wicked problem. This is a 
very serious problem with uh, worrisome potential. And if we don't get a grip on it, and the Chinese don't get a grip on it, there's no telling where it will go. Jessica, you've supported the thaw in relations um, that the Biden administration appears to be pursuing. Could you, could you explain uh, why you think it's so important right now? Yeah, I basically think that we're in an action-reaction spiral, where actions that we take and that the Chinese take to, to ostensibly put ourselves in a stronger position simply precipitate uh, a reaction or a counter-reaction on the other side to, to punch back. I mean, this is very much the Xi Jinping that we are dealing with in Beijing. He's somebody who thinks that it's important to, to show unity at home and strength abroad in order to not be pushed around. This is his theory of security, right? You know, throw a punch punch right back. And so to my mind, it's really important that we begin to slow that spiral towards a conflict that neither side uh, wants. And frankly, the whole world is jumping up and down and saying, cool it, guys. And so, I mean, I think that's part of what is frankly motivating uh, this so-called thaw, which frankly, I think is just a matter of resuming conversations. I mean, I don't actually think we are um, aiming at the kinds of potential uh, reciprocal concessions that would be and, and uh, kind of steps back from the brink that I frankly think are necessary to lower the tensions. I think the aim of this set of re-engagements is really about putting what they call a floor under the relationship so that it doesn't get any worse. I think there's a challenge here, though, uh, which is that we have elections coming up in Taiwan. We have elections that are coming up here in the United States. And one of the challenges of seeing China as you know, the biggest challenge is not that we do quietly the things that we need to do to strengthen ourselves, not just in the military space, but frankly on um, science, technology, education, all the things that are kind of going to be the basis of our long run uh, prosperity and leadership in the world. But instead, politicians say, well, I'm just going to stand up to China and I'm going to take whatever action necessary to just sort of, you know, face down Xi Jinping. And frankly, that unfortunately, I think first it precipitates a counter response. And in the context of Taiwan, it makes it less and less clear that the United States is fundamentally committed to maintaining the status quo as opposed to, as the Chinese say, you know, using Taiwan to contain China. That's very much their perception. And so I'm worried that politics here in the United States around strengthening ourselves, frankly, um, end up becoming, a, you know, just let's wail on China, and that's the way uh, to get, to, you know, to earn political points. But to your point about the bipartisan consensus, I see it starting to crumble, because you see, for example, Representative Mike Gallagher writing an op-ed uh, in the Wall Street Journal calling this sort of zombie engagement, calling this appeasement, and you have, you know, Representative Meeks on the Democratic side saying, no, this anti-China rhetoric is actually a distraction um, from what we need to do here at home to get our house in order. So so I think going forward, hopefully there will be more, I think, robust debate about how to get results for the United States in this long run uh, challenge of managing our relationship with China. I want to get back to Taiwan later, but Jorge, you were Mexico's ambassador to, to Beijing and, and, and spoke quite bluntly yesterday about how frustrating it is to the rest of the world, uh, to this obsession with U.S.-China. Could you, could you expound on that? I think it's an important point. So I, I was saying that for me, a the U.S.-China relationship is the most boring aspect of the way China engages <laughs> with the world. <laughs> and, and, and I'll explain myself. It's not unlike what, watching Republicans and Democrats. Positions are staked. Uh, everybody knows what the other one thinks. The consequences are huge. Yes, there's war or the debt ceiling, you know. The consequences of something going wrong are huge. But pretty much the opinions are set. Uh, I find it much more interesting to see how China engages with other countries in the world, uh, countries like the Philippines, which were long allies of the United States, tried to pivot to China, found it very hard, back to the United States, countries like Canada, who also try to reach out to the PRC uh, after the Meng Wanzhou event, uh, suffered uh, economic coercion. And that's where you see the PRC exercising its muscle much more than with the United States. With the United States, they know they cannot get away with it. With other countries, they do. And at the same time, other parts of the world are still trying to make up their minds on how they're going to engage China. The U.S. is not making up its mind anymore. And I'll give you the example of the Europeans, which go back and forth on whether they're going to be closer or farther from China. But there's a case, for instance, China has a huge lead on electric vehicles, by far, and everybody acknowledges it. Europe has a mandate that they will phase out the internal combustion by 2035. 
will they allow Chinese manufacturers to come to Europe and pretty much overtake the uh, European car manufacturers or not? That won't happen in the United States. If a Chinese car manufacturer tried to set up shop in the United States, there would be congressional hearings, there would be accusations of spying, you know. So it's not happening in the United States, it's happening in other parts of the world. And I think we miss the big picture when we just focus on the U.S.-China relationship. So that's my point of view as a, as a Mexican watching no, it's a, it's, a, it's a very important point of view. <laughs> I'd like to, and Stephen, starting with you, what are you most worried about when it comes to, A, this le level of rhetoric, and B, kind of how it's affecting what's happening in China? You, you told me yesterday that you're really concerned about the economy in China right now and, and how it, if it gets weaker, could be something that pushes Xi Jinping to do, to do things like, like Taiwan. Like it, it, it's, it's much weaker than, than maybe we realize. Well, I'm an economist, so certainly I will um, <laughs> be most worried about economic uh, issues. Um, but I would just say generally, Rebecca, and then I'll get specifically to the question you asked, that when economies are vulnerable either the United States or China, then uh, politicians will want to deflect blame away from the role they play in supporting policies that contribute to that vulnerability. And so lashing out uh, at a, um, uh, a foreign uh, partner is a very politically expedient device that is used both in uh, China and the United States. China's vulnerability is very, a very important piece of the equation. Uh, and in the, the model I worry about the most for China uh, is the, um, uh, the Japanese stagnation that's now in its third decade. Uh, Japan had a, a couple of serious problems that China now has. Uh, a declining working age population uh, and uh, inadequate productivity growth. China's working age population is now contracting 18 years later than um, Japan's and its productivity is going down because of the focus on state-owned enterprises and the tight regulations on uh, the private sector, especially the internet uh, companies. And under Xi Jinping, there doesn't seem to be any real uh, strategy to boost productivity to offset the declining population. So if he gets in a Japanese-like growth quagmire, then he's going to be much more aggressive uh, to um, uh, deflect attention away from the problems that his policies have created. And we have to be very careful of, of that possibility. Jessica, you've, you've spoken about just the tone of the, of the rhetoric and the impact it's having on Asian Americans and Asian American um, hate crimes. Could you, I think it's a really important point. Absolutely. I mean, I think we need to remember that, you know, throughout history, when the United States has taken, uh, you know, an external enemy, we have, whether that was, uh, you know, Japan in World War II, or we have, you know, after 9-11, we have seen a surge uh, at home of hate crimes and attacks, and not to mention the actual internment of, of millions of Japanese Americans. And so we need to be very careful that even though I think politicians try to responsibly say, well, we're just, you know, our, our, we don't have a beef with the Chinese people, it's just the Chinese Communist Party, we have to recognize that the collateral damage at home is already here. Uh, we saw it spike during the pandemic, and I think it's just here to stay. And I worry very much uh, that efforts to uh, you know, beat China um, are going to be felt uh, on the streets for people who look like me, even though you know, born in Seattle. You know, one of the real fears that I have in this is that in our efforts to slow China down, we are going to slow ourselves down, and frankly, we might trip and fall on our faces. You know, one of the main sources, a uh, key driver of American scientific and technological and economic leadership in the world has been our ability to attract and admit, uh, talent uh, from around the world. Right? We're a nation of immigrants, and unfortunately, uh, uh, the rhetoric and the policies, um, both from an immigration as well as the rhetoric and the, the sort of the, very, the intense scrutiny of any kinds of international collaboration, mean that we are losing now. Whereas five years ago uh, we were a net beneficiary of, of STEM talent, uh, now we're a net kind of we're losing, where it's a brain drain rather than a brain gain. And this is a time at which, you know, many in China don't want to stay there. They want to come to the United States. We should be making it easier, uh, not harder. And I'm afraid that the surveys suggest that um, something like 60% uh, of uh, Chinese-born 
Uh, scientists uh, here in the United States who are many of them permanent residents, uh, naturalized citizens, they don't feel safe in this country and they're thinking about leaving. Probably not back to China, some of them to China, but others to, to Europe and Canada. So if we want to main sure, maintain that the United States remains the destination of choice, not only for uh, you know, scientists and engineers, but also businesses, frankly, we need to take very good care uh, that we don't end up undoing uh, the very sources of our strength. Bridge, what are you just I, just one of one course. quick point to just underscore what Jessica said that is so very important. In, in 1987, uh, a young man um, by the name of Vincent Chin, Chinese American, was murdered by two uh, unhappy UAW auto workers um, uh, in a bar fight in Detroit, Michigan, because they held Vincent Chin a Chinese American accountable uh, for um, uh, the, pro the threat that they perceived to be coming from Japanese uh, car makers. So, you know, we've got to really think about, you know, a, a pretty ugly history we have uh, in this country in lashing out at others that make us uncomfortable and doing it in such a, um, uh, a hideous uh, and a threatening way to well-meaning uh, American citizens. That's such an important point. Um, Bridge, what are, what are you worried about unintended consequences? Well, look, I, I think what's really important is in, in this kind of rivalry, which is, I, I think, going to be enduring because it's largely structural, um, and the incentives on both sides, I mean, I think some of the incentives that Stephen and, and Jessica were just talking about, I agree with. I mean, the potential, Xi Jinping has said, Apparently, and I don't speak Chinese, but it's, you know, Ling Ling Wei reported it, that, that he is, believes that we are attempting to strangle China. And you regularly see from the Chinese government that we are seeking to contain and suppress them. So there is a security dilemma type element. And for those who aren't familiar, it's basically both sides believe themselves to be at threat um, and they take sort of actions to, to improve their position, which can contribute to that. Um, my view is that what really this, and this sounds a little bit old fashioned, but I think it's absolutely true, is that what this is most about for us is to get the military balance right. Why do I say that? Because um, a couple things. One, I think we have found ourselves that economic leverage is very difficult to turn into dramatic political outcomes. I think what China is seeking to create is a secure, large economic sphere that prevents us from containing and suppressing them. They're going around the world and trying to find markets. They're trying to find natural resources, et cetera, in places like Latin America, et cetera. That, that is actually, that's understandable. We may not like it, but it's understandable. How can they do so? I think their first instinct is to use things like Belt and Road Initiative and all the other potpourri of initiatives that are around that to basically create economic leverage and then create that sort of sphere peacefully. Unfortunately for them, and I think somebody said it earlier, they are actually precipitating a counter reaction, the balancing reaction that's already happening around the world. I was just in Israel last week. They have dramatically uh, decreased their amount of economic uh, exchange. Europe, that's happening. Uh, Latin America, there were stories about it, certainly in places like South Asia. India, of course, has thrown out all of the Chinese apps. So that's happening. And we have found that we've had difficulty turning our economic sanctions. Our economic sanctions are not working very well against Russia right now. They haven't worked against North Korea, Cuba, etc. So what does that do? Well, if you, if you, you know, the Chinese can give up. But what I'm afraid of is that they're going to seek to use military forces to achieve that goal, especially because they think they are being put upon. They think they are the victims. And who's right or wrong is basically sort of immaterial. <laughs> because we both perceive ourselves as to be the wrong party. In that situation, I think what we need to do is have a very strong military defense. And actually, Stephen laid it out. I'm not even sure that's, I fully agree with that. But the incentives for the employment of military force are going to go up. And here's the most disturbing thing. If you look at the empirical le uh, record, that is what the Chinese are trying to do. They are building a military. They, they increase their military spending yet again by 7%, despite slowing economic growth. Um, they are, clearly, their scenario is to take on the United States. They are in nuclear breakout, which they always said they wouldn't do. They are seeking to sanction-proof their economy. And, of course, Xi Jinping, now, the, the Biden administration is saying, in 2027, he wants the PLA to be ready for, to, to take on, to seize Taiwan, which has irredentist purposes, but is also, I think, much, a lot, part of a much larger geopolitical purpose. What do we do about that? And, by the way, don't take that from me. You said the Trump administration and the Biden administration. A left-wing administration in this country is saying that. I mean, people are, they're saying that an, an attack is not imminent, 
Well, that's not very reassuring. If war happens in three or four or five years, that doesn't, that's not good for us. So the real question is, to me is how do we deter China from doing that, but also give it a graceful exit, basically, a better alternative. And the way that I, and I actually end my book with what I call a decent peace, which I say we need to give a clear defense perimeter, which is a strategy of denial that the Chinese cannot project military force effectively and subordinate countries in the Indo-Pacific. And if they're successful there, they'll be successful elsewhere because that's where 50% or more of global GDP is. But at the same time, I actually think we do need to tone down the rhetoric on a lot of things. I thought the president was ill-advised um, to call Xi Jinping a dictator, but I've also been critical of my friends like Congressman Gallagher and Matt Pottinger for, I think, in a sense, existentializing this conflict, that it's about regime change that it's about you know that that encourages not because i like communism i hate communism but because we want the chinese to say well maybe goal a plus for xi jinping is hegemonic control over asia and from that place global preeminence the worst outcome is defeat in a war with the americans so they don't want to do that so maybe they'll settle for b which is one of the world's two superpowers respect with the americans and then from that position, we can, we can negotiate detente. Where I dif disagree with people like Henry Kissinger is I think if we reach out for detente now, we're going to incentivize and induce the very aggressive behavior that we want to avoid. Jorge, what are you most worried about? Worried about? Um, <laughs> I think, so I live in Washington, D.C. I've been living in Washington, D.C. Uh, for 10 years. And I think uh, every week there's a, a new panel, a new paper, a new conference on Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and, and I always say, I always think of the David Letterman uh, show in the, and now let's play Belt and Road Initiative, thing or not a thing. And, you know, <laughs> Paul Schaefer, song, uh, music, you know, and I always fall in the not a thing. It's not a thing. That's not where it's happening. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative gets a lot of coverage. Uh, people assume China is taking over the world uh, through its Belt and Road Initiative. I haven't seen a single country pivot towards China because of the Belt and Road Initiative. I think uh, where it's happening is with Chinese companies coming with just superior technology in certain areas, again, uh, electric vehicles. I think that's uh, the biggest change we're going to be seeing uh, is how quickly, let me put it this way, just as quickly as TikTok overtook Facebook and became this huge thing, the same is going to happen with electric vehicles. The United States is not as worried about it because, again, uh, just uh, a Chinese company trying to form a joint venture with Ford, in which the Chinese company, mind you, has better technology for uh, electric vehicle batteries, was blocked in Virginia, got political. So they're not going to choose the United States uh, to spread uh, their wings. They're going to choose other countries. Uh, are the other countries ready? Uh, I am very concerned about uh, Chinese economic coercion. Uh, they, they use it, they use it actively. So any country that tries to resist uh, Chinese companies coming into their markets will face a uh, coercion. And my concern is that the PRC is just getting too powerful and influential for countries to resist that. That's, that's where I see my, my worries going. How should we regard Xi Jinping? Um, he, he is the strongest leader since Mao. Um, there has, he's taken a very hard line. Um, there's been uh, so many imprisonments in China, including, I, I just have to say, Fan Bao, who the head of China Renaissance, one of the top uh, tech bankers. He's part of the Aspen Global Leadership Network, and he was detained in February and has not resurfaced. Um, but yet, it also feels that, that we've continued to make a mistake of thinking that she and China will liberalize. Um, just a quick, this is not a quick topic, but um, how, should, how should we really regard him and his ambitions? Just briefly, I, I would not want to personalize the conflict that, you know, if it weren't for she, things would be fine. Um, there were changes occurring throughout um, uh, the 25 years that preceded him that were pointing in this direction, especially under his uh, immediate predecessor, uh, Hu Jintao. Uh, ideology is, you know, sort of the, uh, the backstop for the, the, the Chinese system, uh, and out of ideology flows their views on power projection, uh, economic control, dealing with um, uh, what they, th they think is a uh, corrupt uh, bureaucracy. 
uh, and maintaining a hold on uh, their system. But, you know, they have a pretty wide, they have had, I should say, a pretty wide uh, ring fence um, uh, for behavior within their ideological control. Under Xi, it is tightened in a, in a, in a worrisome way uh, as the, uh, uh, the Chinese people uh, have become uh, wealthier and understandably, as human nature would have it, want more freedoms, and he has resisted that. I know I was going to be brief, but the last thing is it's a little bit of a surprise. His father was a leading reformer that led economic reforms uh, in Guangdong province uh, uh, in the early stages of opening up. Uh, and uh, we sort of thought he would, um, you know, be, a, be an apple from the same tree, and he's turned out not to be. Jessica, Bridge, anyone want to jump? Yeah, I would just say that I think that Xi Jinping's apparent strength masks a deep insecurity, not just himself, but for the party. The Chinese Communist Party is one of the few uh, remaining communist uh, parties that's leading uh, around the world. Most of the other communist parties have, have regimes have collapsed, and I think that Xi Jinping and the rest of the CCP elite are very concerned about going the same way. And so a lot of the measures that you've seen him adopt abroad, but also domestically, are really an effort to shore up the security uh, of one-party rule uh, in China. And so on the horizon, we have no apparent successor to Xi. He's unlikely to be in power for at least another 10 years. Who knows? Um, and to me, that means that we don't have the luxury uh, to wait to achieve uh, detente sometime down the road. I mean, I love that you and I, despite our disagreements, are land in the same place about what we're actually aiming toward. To me, though, we have to take into account what we are leaving on the table and what are the risks that we are willing to run in the next 10 years if, or however long it takes us to get our kind of act together in terms of our military capabilities. I hear it sometime out in the 2030s. To me, I don't want to relive, I mean, I wasn't alive, but I don't want to relive the kind of eyeball to eyeball crises, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the others. Um, that's not a world I want to live in. I think we ought to aspire to better. And more importantly, we are now in a world where other shared problems, not to mention climate change, um, you know, that we don't have the luxury of just sort of not dealing uh, with China. China is a problem, but it's also part of the solution. So for example, electric vehicle technology. We need to be in a place where we can take advantage and license a Chinese uh, EV technology building plants here in the United States, making jobs. But think about, you know, like the cost of cancer drugs. I heard the other day that three out of eight Americans can't afford, uh, you know, prescription drugs to address these, you know, these um, kinds of diseases. And so China is part of the solution here, too. If we are working, uh, scientists are collaborating, we can have clinical trials in China, we can lower the cost of prescription drugs. These are areas where it's simply in our interest to find ways, not necessarily to cooperate at the diplomatic level, but just to simply allow the kind of cross-border uh, collaborations, the integration of our two uh, economies. I mean, decoupling is kind of a fantasy. Nobody's talk really serious, I think, is really talking about that, given the record levels of trade. But it's not just kind of pocketbook issues. It's also about the real, uh, you know, the dangers that we collectively face. And I don't want to wait, uh, you know, 10, 15 years to figure out if we will have survived uh, the military crises to then finally tackle these other issues that are so pressing. Yeah, well, and I, 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 it's encouraging. I think detente should be our goal. And then if there's a debate about how to, how do we get there, what I would say, I, I, kind of two points. One is I think fundamentally China's behavior, again, to me primarily doesn't mean that there aren't obviously specific contingent factors that are very important, but the driving factor is China's growth and strength. And that creates opportunities. Uh, my favorite example of this is, you know, Colin Powell is the father of the Powell Doctrine and the Reagan administration say, oh, you don't use all this force. But then of course it also built up the Reagan defense build up military, then Madeleine Albright comes into office and she wants to intervene in Yugoslavia and Powell's saying all these things and, and she says, well, why do we have this amazing military if we can't use it? Which gets it like this basic idea, which is once power is created, it becomes not only more tempting to use it, but people who are arguing for using it become more compelling. And we've seen this in our own system over the last generation, I would say. Um, I think the fundamental driver of Chinese behavior is neither Xi Jinping himself nor actually Marxism. So, you know, I was at the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, earlier this month in Singapore, and the speech 
if the Kuomintang had won the Civil War, you could have heard the same speech. They mentioned communism only once to refer to the imp important role of the CCP in the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, which is a nationalist mission. So the basic idea that Xi Jinping, now Xi Jinping himself is clearly a Marxist, a genuine Marxist in some sense that I don't particularly pretend to understand. But the basic thrust to me is a nationalism, the way a great power operates. So what that means is we have to prepare for the long haul and we have to basically pursue the strategy in my view that I'm talking about, which is str measured strength combined with a willingness to make um, make uh, sort of opportunities. And where I think that's, that all said, she seems to be a leader who is on the, you know, in, in the structural bound that you have, he is on the more aggressive side, possibly because of insecurity, but also, and there's a debate about this, and I'm, I don't have a super strong view of exactly, but it seems to be that she has sort of voluntarily linked the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, the central political project of the People's Republic, with the resolution of the Taiwan issue, and Xi Jinping is not immortal, right? I mean, he's a Marxist, so we can, we can assume that, right? So this is a very dangerous situation. So in a sense, what my hope is, I actually think we'd be lucky to get into a Cold War. I think a lot of people are assuming that we could get into a Cold War. I think there's a very real possibility we get into a hot war. If we can go back to the kind of Cold War, that's not as good as it could be, but that's a lot less bad than it could be. Maybe we could get early Brezhnev and a detente after a Khrushchev, but we have to get through that. And the critical thing is to make it incentivize Xi Jinping rightly not to try to take advantage of the situation. Rich, that underscores the point you made earlier, the difference between you young guys and us old guys. <laughs> well, I, didn't, I don't you know, think I don't we want to go back to the you know, cold, you know, cold War, you know? Yeah. That well, was the Cold not, War was better than World War II, that right? Was not a, yeah, it was. <laughs> but that, that, that's not a great place to be, and it underscores the fact that when you're in this Cold War, the risks of going hot are much more serious than otherwise would be the case. So uh, where I would agree with you is that you know, the whole architecture of engagement between these two nations, us and China, needs to change. You have a defense approach. I have more of a, uh, uh, an economic approach, but uh, the way in which we are managing this relationship is not working. So time is quickly running out, Jorge. I want to, I want to get to Taiwan directly. Um, there, it's come up several times. There is a, a, a growing nervousness that there, there is a plan, that it could be executed, um, uh, and, and quite frankly, a nervousness about what the U.S. and the rest of the world will do. Um, obviously, the chips on Taiwan make this an incredibly important issue for the entire global economy. What is your view of, of, um, you know, our, of, of Taiwan? What would the, since you're speaking for the rest of the world here, um, um, how well, would, how would, uh, how would uh, uh, they view it? And, and just a quick survey here of, 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 is there a willingness in the U.S. to fight for Taiwan? So let, let me start by saying that anytime I'm in, a, I'm in a conversation with someone who says or claims to know what the Chinese leadership is thinking, I stop listening because exactly. honestly, nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. Nobody knows. We can all say speculate, yeah. but when we speculate, we speculate with our values and with our viewpoints, with our Western. And, and so, honestly, I don't know. Uh, now, how would the world react? Uh, again, I think that's uh, very much an issue of. Washington is very good at, war, at cold warring. Everybody in Washington knows how to, how to fight a cold war. There's a lot of experience. Uh, so there's always this quick analogy to the Cold War, uh, Soviet Union. I don't think that the world is approaching this Taiwan issue the same way for the simple reason that the big surprise for, for this audience maybe is that it has become increasingly difficult for most every country in the world to deal with China, period. China is a very hard country to deal and agree with. So that's why you see this realignment of countries that wanted to be sort of neutral, uh, all of a sudden saying, well, you know, we're kind of neutral, but we would dislike uh, China moving in on Taiwan. Will they move or not? I don't know. I do think that there will be world consequences if they do, because nobody is prone to side with China on this right now. Carter, Jessica, anyone want to jump in quickly? 
Yeah, I just worry here that some of the actions that we are ostensibly taking to strengthen uh, Taiwan, to show our commitment uh, in the absence of, of you know, real measures uh, to close this window of vulnerability that we on the United States side feel. Of course, Taiwan also has lots of vulnerabilities. They're not moving expeditiously to close it. And in the interim, we are talking about the need to get ready to do things. It's just feeding what I see on the Chinese side as a belief that the United States is trying to incrementally separate Taiwan permanently from China. And that is something that no leader, Xi Jinping or otherwise, I think could allow. And so what we are seeing is, in my view, uh, this uh, willingness or interest in getting the military ready is not to say, okay, as soon as the military is ready, we're going to go. Instead, it's that we need to be ready because the United States and Taiwan are collectively cooking up an effort uh, toward Taiwan independence, and the PLA needs to be much better prepared than it has been to date to prevent that, to deter that. So I think that, of course, it's not impossible that I think that as China becomes more militarily capable, that they will use that to coerce an outcome or compel an outcome that's more favorable. But at the end of the day, this is not going to be a bloodless victory. There's, I think, very little, uh, little risk that because of an economic downturn, somehow China tries to seize the opportunity. This is not like a little easy war that they're going to win. This is a very difficult uh, target, and it is going to be potentially catastrophic militarily, economically, certainly, given the semiconductors. So actually, it's, I think it's fascinating that on this panel, we actually have a fair amount of agreement that to the extent that the Chinese economy and, uh, continues to have sort of a pathway to help Xi Jinping achieve his goal of national rejuvenation, that actually serves as a bit of a restraint on the use of military force, which would completely upend uh, that possibility. And so actually, from the perspective of thinking about the continuation of you know, US business investment and trade and such with China, that's actually not a bad thing from the perspective of deterring a catastrophic conflict. And we need to be careful as we de-risk uh, not to lose sight of the fact that it could be a lot worse. Bridge. Yeah, so, so actually quite a bit I agree with. What my, my basic view is speak softly and carry a big stick, whereas I think now we're speaking loudly and carrying a small or medium stick. A lot of the visits, a lot of the Taiwan, there are prominent American politicians who are talking about Taiwan independence. That's extremely ill-advised. So my view is that Beijing, looking at it kind of deductively as a great power, it is about irredentism, but it's also about breaking out of this, what they regard as this encirclement by the United States and establishing this sort of hegemonic position, which is very attractive. And I don't, it's actually natural for them to want that. We ourselves have used the military effectively over the course of our history to establish a more advantageous position. Um, to the extent that we can mitigate the sense that they have that we are moving away from their, the one China policy, even of ourselves, we should try to do that and we should downplay. What I'm afraid of, though, is like Jessica is taking more confidence. I don't know what Xi Jinping will do. But when I look at the indicators, they are all very worrying. There's his rhetoric, but more importantly than that are the capabilities, including not only the capabilities and the exercising and seeking to remedy the defects in their military readiness for Taiwan contingency, which by the way, they assume would be a regional war with the United States. They're also clearly building a military that assumes they've subsumed Taiwan. That is very, why are they building aircraft carriers? Aircraft carriers are not relevant for a Taiwan scenario. Why are they seeking basing architecture in South Asia, in Africa, in the South Pacific, et cetera? And here's the thing is that Yes, there are major downsides and risk. It's a cosmic roll of the dice, as Harold Brown once put it. But it also would be incredibly beneficial if they won. That's the thing. And he is a hard-headed guy. My view is he has already done things that are more personally risky to himself and his family than a war with the United States would probably be. I mean, Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong survived wars with, with the United States. Lin Biao, Liu Shaoqi, they were purged internally. Internal struggles in China more dangerous. So I don't know what they're going to do, but I want to make sure that he sees that he is going to be denied or that Beijing is going to be denied success. That's the only... But I agree with you completely, as far as I understand, that we should be seeking to mitigate the perception. That's why I thought Blinken's comments actually the other day that were controversial. I thought they were not bad on Taiwan. Other things I had objection to. But this saying that we oppose Taiwan independence, I think is, is actually appropriate because the status quo is fine for us. They may not even believe that that's sufficient, which is scary. But I think the main thing is we should be trying to pursue this speak softly and carry a big stick approach. But I, Rick, I, I just, go. Your, your, your fears that you're expressing are understandable but they're based on presumption that you have underscored uh, repeatedly by saying, I don't know. And I think we have to be careful about putting in place a, a tough um, strategy that, that runs the risk of kinetic conflict 
based solely on presumption of behavior. But we do know there are unprecedented historic it. military buildup, yeah. and that's from this Biden administration. That's we, what we, we do know. We, we understand that they have, they have uh, built up their force level, but is that necessarily uh, a guarantee of the actions that you fear? You do, you do not know that. Well, it's not a guarantee. We have, we, have we have a president who I'm very fond of, uh, who four times has misspoken about our intentions uh, to uh, uh, use U.S. troops uh, against the PLA were they to move in China. We say, oh, it's just Joe. Uh, but they don't see it that way in, in Beijing. They react very, very differently. I uh, promised Stephen we would end with solutions. We are literally <laughs> out of time, um, but, but um, I... I would love to just do a very quick um, uh, uh, survey of you all. There's, there's, there's decoupling, there's de-risking, um, there, there's more engagement. Um, if you were to offer one and very quick recommendation, could we go down the line of just something that we should be stressing more as we look at this relationship at this very, very delicate moment, what would it be? I think we need a new architecture of engagement. I've written a book about it. I have a proposal for what I call a U.S.-China Secretariat, which is a full-time organization that deals with all aspects of the relationship located in a neutral country uh, and troubleshoots difficult problems, many of which we have discussed here today, uh, but does it on a full-time permanent basis rather than uh, you know, you know, these trips like um, Blinken makes to Beijing. I'd say that we need to work more on deterring rather than provoking. I think we need to run faster ourselves and focus less on slowing China down. And I think finally we need to aim not at beating or outcompeting China, but at securing a future in which the, you know, that works for Americans regardless of who is first uh, among equals. And that in involves figuring out a peaceful but constructive coexistence where competition is disciplined uh, to what we seek rather than what we fear. Rich. Yeah, I mean, I would speak softly and carry a big stick. I mean, as I call it, a strategy of denial militarily. So focus our provocations, so to speak, towards China on military preparedness and less on the rhetoric or even some of the economic decoupling, which may be advisable for our own purposes, but strategically, I think, is not, it's not strictly necessary. And the system, the, the bipolar, the, the sort of the U.S.-China system is, is already incredibly pressurized. So I think we need to really be judicious in where we put our provocations, if you will. Uh, I'll just close by something that I'm paying attention to, uh, demographic decline. By the year 2050, that's 23, 27 years from now, uh, China's working age population is supposed to decrease by 130 million. That's pretty much uh, Mexico's and Vietnam's entire working age population combined. Uh, where, uh, who's going to pick up uh, that role of a uh, factory to the world? Is it going to be automation? I doubt it, it will all be automation. Uh, where will that go? So that's something I'm uh, paying attention to. That's where I'll leave it. I'd like you to join me in thanking our panelists. Thank Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.